How do you debunk misinformation? An effective rebuttal requires three elements, fact, myth, fallacy. I'm going to explain how to tie these together into a cohesive debunking. The most important element of a debunking is the fact that dislodges the myth. To understand this, you need to think about what happens under the hood when you debunk a myth. We all form mental models of how the world works. Our mental models are a series of interconnected parts. A causes B, B causes C. But what happens when you learn that B is wrong? In 2002, Colin Seifert tested what happened when people read misinformation about a warehouse fire followed by a retraction. At first, people were told the fire was started by some paint and gas cylinders in the room where the fire started. Some participants were later given a retraction, clarifying the room had no paint or gas cylinders. Other participants didn't receive a retraction. The researchers found the retraction didn't have much effect on removing the misinformation. People who read the correction believed that paint and gas started the fire just as much as people who never got the correction. The misinformation continued to influence them. The researchers called this the continued influence effect. Not the most imaginative title, but at least you get the idea. When you debunk misinformation, you're reaching into a person's mental model and removing the myth. That creates a gap in their mental model. But people don't like gaps in their mental models. It makes them feel uncomfortable. That's why the misinformation comes back and continues to influence. We prefer a complete inaccurate model over an incomplete, more accurate model. Seifert found the most effective way to reduce the continued influence effect was to produce an alternative explanation for the fire. She found if the retraction included evidence for arson in the form of gasoline-soaked rags near bales of paper, then participants stopped believing the original misinformation. It's not enough to tell people the myth is wrong. You also need to provide an explanation that neatly replaces the myth in their mental model. Let me give an example. One climate myth is that the sun is causing global warming. It should be enough to show how over the last few decades, sun and climate have been moving in opposite directions. Global warming can't be caused by the sun because solar activity has been having a cooling effect on climate. But that isn't enough. You also need to provide an alternative explanation for global warming. In this case, there are many observed patterns in climate change that not only rule out the sun, but also point to an alternative explanation greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. Let's pick one. The upper atmosphere is cooling while the lower atmosphere warms. If the sun was causing global warming, the whole atmosphere should warm. But this pattern is a distinct pattern of greenhouse warming. So providing an alternative explanation is a key element to debunking misinformation. I used to call this an alternative fact. Then this happened. You're saying it's a falsehood and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave Alternative facts. Alternative causal explanation is a bit of a mouthful. Now, I usually call it a replacement fact. Your fact needs to be plausible and it needs to fit all the causal links left by the myth. In fact, it should fit into the person's mental model even better than the myth. The person should feel as if they understand the world better after the debunking. Your debunking should emphasize the fact more than the myth. Lead with the fact. Use the fact as your headline. Unfortunately, many fact checks and debunkings tend to lead with the myth. This is problematic as people tend to skim information in shallow ways and sometimes only take in the headline. Confession time. When I started Skeptical Science, I committed this error, using the myth as the headline. But as I learned about the psychological research into debunking, I updated how we structured our rebuttals. First, I changed the headlines to emphasize the fact rather than the myth. Then I added more emphasis to the fact but we still have work to do, updating our rebuttals to fit the fact-myth fallacy structure. But there's more. It's not enough to identify the replacement fact and emphasize it in your debunking. You also need to make your facts sticky. Batman, what happened? Are you okay? He slimed me. By this, I mean you need to communicate your science in a way that grabs people's attention and sticks in their memories. A useful framework for making science communication sticky comes from the book Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. They explore what makes a message attention-grabbing and memorable. They also ask the important question, how do you unstick a bad idea? Their advice, fight sticky myths with stickier facts. I call this the golden rule of debunking. It's not enough to merely explain the science. We need to communicate the science in engaging, sticky ways. How do we do that? The Heath brothers list six characteristics of sticky messages. 
summarized with the acronym SUCCESS. Sticky messages are simple. They're unexpected, taking people by surprise. They're credible. Messages from credible sources are more effective. They're concrete. Messages that are too abstract or statistical are hard for people to relate to. Messages that evoke an emotional reaction are more likely to be shared and remembered. Lastly, we remember information in the form of stories. So explanations in the form of a compelling narrative are stickier in memory. Making your message sticky can be a real challenge, particularly when you're dealing with scientific topics. Science is usually complicated. Research and data is usually abstract and statistical. Scientists are trained to remove emotion from their science in order to be objective. There are various techniques to make science stickier, such as graphics, analogies, and avoiding jargon. But that's a topic worthy of a whole other video. The second element of a debunking is the myth. You do need to mention the myth in a debunking in order for people to tag it in their mental model as false. Early research suggested that mentioning misinformation in a debunking might backfire, causing people to believe the myth even more after they read the debunking. In the debunking handbook, we called it the familiarity backfire effect. But attempts to replicate this in subsequent studies failed to find evidence for a familiarity backfire effect. It turns out the backfire effect isn't quite the boogeyman it's been made out to be. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. One of the most important messages coming out of misinformation research over the last decade is this. Don't let fear of a hypothetical backfire effect stop you from debunking misinformation. It's more dangerous to let misinformation stand unchallenged. Unfortunately, Facebook has used the backfire effect as an excuse to avoid fact-checking misinformation. There is a simple strategy to reduce the danger of increasing familiarity with misinformation. Warn them before mentioning the myth. Warning! Alien approaching! Warning! Biophysical experiments extremely dangerous to Earth people! Warning! Warning! Extraterrestrial life form approaching! Warning! Warning! Do not open inner door! Yeah. This puts people cognitively on guard, so they're less likely to be influenced by the misinformation. There is no more danger of radioactive poisoning. A warning can be a simple visual cue, like graphics or use of color. Or even more straightforward, just preceding the myth with something like one myth is that the third element of a debunking is explaining the fallacy or rhetorical technique the misinformation uses to mislead. When you present fact and myth together, what you've done is present two conflicting pieces of information. The danger is when people can't resolve that conflict, the danger is they'll disengage and not believe either. So help people resolve the conflict between fact and myth by explaining how the myth distorts the facts. A useful framework to help you identify and explain fallacies in misinformation are the five techniques of science denial, summarized with the acronym FLIC. Fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking, and conspiracy theories. The FLIC taxonomy is a large detailed landscape of rhetorical techniques, logical fallacies, and traits of conspiratorial thinking. Going into those techniques in detail is again a topic for a whole other video. The fact myth fallacy structure is versatile and can be applied in a variety of ways. I've used it in many infographics. It's a powerful way of including the key elements of a debunking in a concise, digestible format. In our massive open online course about climate misinformation, all our seven minute video debunkings use the fact myth fallacy structure, debunking the most common myths about climate change. I wrote a textbook with Professor Dan Bedford about climate change, where each chapter followed fact myth fallacy. This is the only textbook to our knowledge based on the principles of misconception based learning, teaching science by directly addressing science misconceptions. Misconception based learning has been shown to be one of the most powerful ways of teaching science, as well as longer lasting than just teaching the science alone. So to reiterate, here are the key principles of debunking. First, Lead with a sticky fact that replaces the myth. Second, warn people before you mention the myth. Third, explain the fallacy the myth uses to distort the facts. Debunking misinformation doesn't have to be a necessary evil. Creating gaps, then filling those gaps with facts and critical thinking can be a powerful form of storytelling. Presenting conflicting information, then resolving the conflict is the key to building a coherent and effective rebuttal.